Welcome back, everybody. This is Night Flight, and today it's time to talk to Eve Logan again. Our subject will be narcissistic abuse, and especially in cults, and we will also focus on the question, why in the hell do we fall for cults time and again? So, welcome back, Eve. Very good to have you on the show. How are you? I'm I'm good. It's it's springtime here in the States. So I did some planting and it's always exciting to see the things grow and get a new sense of uh, newness. And uh, so things are good. And new insights as well um, with clients and with just the general trend. So it's always good to, to speak with you about new things and how they're showing up. Yeah, <laughs> that is sometimes the most uh, fascinating part, how they show up. Yeah, or they continue to show up, but in different permutations or connections that show, to me, there's connections between things that can be uh, understood in different ways or articulated in different ways. I see your cat is, is running around. Yeah, yeah, I'm being attacked by a cat. <laughs> so um, before we jump into our uh, subject... Uh, I just recently, and I mean, the, this is a topic that go, has been going on for like forever. And uh, I received a comment and uh, in that comment, and it was underneath one of our uh, interviews. And in that comment, uh, the person said that uh, we have it all wrong and that uh, aliens are demons. End of okay. story. So uh, where do you stand? Um, to me, alien and demons are not one and the same. Um, what would you say? Well, I mean, I just take with the experiences that people are having. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it's, it, there are differences because I've seen demons and then I've seen aliens or interacted with different ones. So I, I think demons are definitely in the supernatural realm. And they may have a certain quality where certain prayers work for demons, whereas aliens can be um, corporeal and incorporeal and actually have bodies or not have bodies or shape shift um, in different ways. And then who are working with humans in underground bases. So um, I'm just take it with the experiences that people have. And it seems to me that those who have really black and white views are not like 30-year researchers who've worked with people who've had alien abductions or been in cults and 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 actually worked with people or had experiences of their own. Mm -hmm. But I know that there's some Christian uh, people who've had experiences where they applied prayers and, you know, their faith and the abduction stopped. So, and then they would make the assumption that, well, it's, it's all demonic. But really the question is, what is demonic behavior and what is the energy and drive behind that? What that we call demonic and mm -hmm. predatory. And so in the Bible, it says those who want to kill, steal, and destroy and corrupt. And if they're separated from God, let's say like the fallen angels and all their hybrids or whatever, they, they're going to have certain qualities of separation of that eternal spirit so that the bitterness and the jealousy and the theft and the predation are what's left over. And then those behaviors drive certain certain behaviors towards people who are still connected to the life force so that's why you see the parasitism and the manipulation and the control and the splitting in the, what i'm calling the malevolent aliens and those who are deceitful even on high levels so to me it's like really refining well, what is their energy and what are they doing what are they trying to hide and how does that manifest and then it tells you the quality of what they are and, and then it matters not if they're in human or non-human bodies. What matters is how you, you can deal with it. But I will say that there are um, Christians who have discovered, I'm learning this all the time, like it's, it's not all black and white, where there would be certain prayers against demons and the adversary, um, where demons are like disembodied demonic entities. And the adversary, I think, is is the accuser. It's also that. But when you're dealing with, people in human bodies who are like enemies then um and then there's another form that you use different prayers or different uh how shall i say it because i heard this from amanda buys 
And when there's, a, let's say, when there's a familiar spirit that's a human spirit that, let's say, got demonized or didn't go to heaven or the underworld because they're in a satanic ritual abuse family, and then you get them linked in and they, they follow the bloodline. And this is what you call the iniquity of the familiar spirits linked on in the bloodline. So when those like hang on to you and they act like attached familiar spirit entities, a regular prayer against demons won't work against them and their effect. So then certain prayers and understanding of the true nature of what's present needs to be known and applied so that you can deal with those forces. And I think the same thing goes for aliens and alien abduction and MK Ultra and some of these other things that are not so quite easily defined. Mm. So that's yeah. much my two cents on that one, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I told you that, yeah, we just, uh, yeah, we just finished the season of sacrifice that uh, starts on uh, 22nd of March and lasts until 1st of May. The unofficial beginning is the 19th of March. And uh, because of that, I uh, revisited uh, the Waco uh, massacre. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, everything uh, went up in flames on the 19th of April. Wow. So that, that event, uh, like... Um, Oklahoma uh, bomb. April yeah, 19th. Oklahoma, but the same day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say, yes, uh, David Koresh was a nut job, no doubt about it. But the way they botched that operation, especially the ATF the first day, and then later on uh, the FBI and uh, sending uh, the negotiator away, because they uh, had no more uh, patience uh, for negotiating. And what followed was so horrible. Yeah. And it, it, it feels to me, you know, like it's an, an, a, a competition between idiots. Who can make the most idiotic uh, decision on this matter? Yeah, and that is uh, the protocol that they uh, followed. And okay, 82 people died, including 23 children. And especially when you know little children are in there, that is not how you act. But okay, so. Ah, here, here, here's one interesting piece that I also didn't know uh, before I revisited that. Um, do you know that uh, David Koresh was in Israel, that he made a trip to Israel? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess he had a plan to establish uh, something there, but uh, then they canceled his visa. It, um, and uh, he had to fly back uh, to the United States. Anyhow, uh, <clears throat> there in Israel, uh, he had what he says a yeah a supernatural event, and a chariot with um, was it seven? I, I if memory serves, and the seven angels were in there in that uh, chariot, and they took him into that chariot and they flew up and took him out, 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 higher, higher and higher. And guess where he ended? Uh, Orion. Orion. Oh no, you're kidding. Oh God, reptilian headquarters, right? <laughs> <laughs> or Draco headquarters, I don't know. I'm not an astrologer, so, but Orion is notorious, right? For, well, it's actually yeah. for both. Um, but, well, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. uh, that could bring up a whole different discussion as well about like the angel Moroni and the originator, Joseph Smith of the, uh, well, the ones in the United States and Utah, the Mormons, um, because that was a con job by higher fallen ones. Um, and it manifests later, of course, 
in the whole culty cult kind of experience but in there it's like the polygamy and the pedophilia and then the you know, connected with a little bit of the freemasonry and then pretty soon it just gets all corrupted so it begs the question who are these beings taking them on these um astral or whatever trips and then encouraging them to start some kind of religion or cult that ends in a uh, big loose feed or a disaster or it corrupts what should be something that is good you know like a good community for example yeah yeah but that community um was not very good i would say Be and because he reached a point when you know he was convinced that he was the only one who could produce pure children and therefore um he dissolved the marriages uh, mm -hmm. of his followers and uh, whoever had relations with him was then another wife of him. Oh God, there we go again. It's always the harem and the sexual yes. pedophilia bullshit. I mean, why do they keep doing this over and over and over again? You ever wonder like, what's that about? Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, even... I do not, but even if I entertain the idea, yeah, that um, he's correct on that part, that he is the only one. Yeah, problem is, you know, one, two generations later, you have total incest. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's the by design. I'm telling you, it's by design by, well, if you ask me, the higher, we can call them the higher fallen angels are the ones that are like higher, more deceitful spiritual beings that are very, very good at spiritual deception. And these are the, the super dangerous ones because they don't always appear at first uh, like visions and um, connections or channelings or spirit guides. They, they appear wonderful and they can create wonderful feelings of bliss. And then you only see it down the road of the, the corruption later of a high level spiritual deception, which is very, very dangerous. And it, it almost always goes into some weird perverted sexual thing or, you know, the, with children or, you know, a harem of many women for the one narcissist who's friggin' a, you know, the whole, it's always the same kind of energy. And uh, so that yeah. makes me, uh, you know, go into. And, and, and that is why I found that piece of information about Orion so interesting because I thought, my goodness, um, who knows what really happened there? If he got a, a kind of a creepy download, uh, because when he returned from that uh, trip uh, with, and he also mentioned that angels do not really have wings. Uh, they have a Merkaba and that is a spaceship. So... Yeah, okay. And then when he came back from that um yeah, experience, he claimed to have a full understanding of the Bible, especially the revelation, and then he equated himself to the lamb who is going to open the seven seals. Oh. And the fact that he was 33 at the day of the 19th of April when everything went to shit of course, enforced his delusion. Yeah, the the reinforcement of a delusion, that's big in spiritual deception. Mm -hmm. And and the synchronicities of, um, like, they'll make it so that the synchronicities reinforce this special identification with the hero or the redeemer or the the leader and and then put it all in the, the synchronicities and the mythical parallels of that myth i mean i'm not gonna say it's all a myth but it seems to be they they reinforce that self-delusion um through powerful synchronicity or even like uh what they'd call in the intelligence community establishing their bona fides so that they keep a really good cover and everything looks like they are who they are but they're really not that it's their cover so they they can you know, have 80% truth and 20% delusion. And that 20% is what creates, you know, the, what it really is down the road. Yeah. You know, it, but they do have supernatural power. And uh, it's interesting because I remember Barbara Bartholick mentioning this years ago 
where it was the Marshall Applewhite cult in San Diego. I think it was San Diego County in, um, in a wealthy neighborhood in 1997 when there was the mass suicide. And that uh, Marshall Applewhite and his partner, Bo and Peep, they called it, was a, it was a couple. And she used to be a nurse. And um, they would, you know, they were like a cult. And I don't know if it was uh, mostly Christian or I think it included Christian and an ET type of thing. Um, but he actually had some supernatural manifestations, which some people observed and told Barbie um, privately long before he did the whole night, the whole, uh, what do you call it? Suicide. And um, so that's interesting. So not when people say, oh, they're all fakes. Um, a lot of times they're not all fake in that, in that sometimes there are supernatural or paranormal manifestations with these, these leaders. And so they can actually have something and that's why people believe in them and it can be a good a good delusion and a good control system because they really are good at what they do mm. and uh, it always seems to end in some kind of mass suicide and um, this reminds me of a it was actually a movie i saw on uh, another channel um, it was on peacock tv and it was called uh the sacrament and it was a documentary and they might have dramatized it but it was a, a similar cult where uh a guy goes to visit his sister in a, in a spiritual community that it moved from the U.S. to someplace in Northern Africa because it's cheaper and it's easier there to run a community or a cult. And they visit the cult and they find out that it's run kind of by this creepy guy who um, who is deluded and um, ends up that there's some people who want to escape, but they have to keep secrets. And it, and it turns into a, a mass suicide of 167 people. So it was actually larger than the Koresh um, suicide. And I think all but a few or two guys I escaped. don't believe that that was a suicide. What was it? it was a sacrifice. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a sacrifice of some sort, but I think it's encouraged by the delusion of the leader who thinks at a certain yeah. point they're under like, oh, they're under attack by the evil forces of the world that they won't be able to keep their community. And now is the time of the revelation or the whatever, the great conflict. And they think it's actually better for them to die in whatever they believe in than have this thing be destroyed by the world bankers or whoever. And then they justify this, this thing. But it always seems to be led by, you know, the, the narcissistic cult leader who ends up having sexual relations with more than one and often accesses the children or some of the children get abused. Um, and so that's what was the, what the movie showed. It was actually a single woman and her daughter that they're the ones that kind of spilled the beans on some of the abuse. And, and like the younger daughter was mute from the um, abuse, the effects of the abuse and then mm -hmm. finally told the secrets and they really wanted to escape, but they weren't able to tell the truth. And then they were like guarded by men with guns. So it was all this incongruent, typical cult. But, you know, it turned from something good that maybe in the early days, it was like a traveling ministry that that helped people like older, older women who were widows and single women with children and poor people who were addicts. And then they got into recovery because of their Christian faith. And then and then all of a sudden it just turns bad in the end by one leader who just seems to get diluted with their own sense of hero worship and whatever causes that to happen. It, and it, and I think it's an infection that, or something maybe that happens over time, like they become more and more hosted, more and more diluted. And then, and then it's always like the sexual abuse and control that powers that delusion and that spiritual dark force. And so, and then it'll end up in some kind of sacrifice of some sort. Mm. Like a, it's like an mo you know yeah yeah and david koresh he displayed that early on he was not uh the leader right from the get-go there uh on mount carmel there used to be an elderly woman her name was lois but I, i forgot her last name and she was 50 years older than him wow. yeah and he <laughs> he started a relationship with her and uh, told people that they would um, bring forth uh, a wonderful um, mis yeah, miracle child. Well, kind of like the Abraham and Sarah when, when she was like... Yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, and then... Um, 
I have my doubts that she was really pregnant because she was already in her 70s. Uh, but the story goes like that she miscarried and he uh, dropped her like a hot potato. Ah, it's so it's so predictable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um yeah, so right from the get-go, there is uh something uh, very weird with sexuality uh going on. And um yeah, as you said, it, it's always the same pattern, yeah. And what would you say, Eve? What what are the warning signs that uh, one might be in a cult? Well, yeah, you know, I think cults, the original, I think the original desire for um, like a family connection and community is something that's <laughs> innocent. And, and that would be a natural good thing to have a community that lives in harmony with the same values and that you create um, meaningful uh relationships like family that everybody needs like a human human needs for family and love and connection is a good thing and it, it seems to me that uh, when people go into cults a lot of them that have found themselves vulnerable were people who already had some form of family trauma they might have been raised as a partial orphan or they had um, some kind of you know, family system dysfunction, whether it was an alcoholic parents or not feeling connected and valued as a family member that they could connect and feel loved so that they just are gravitate towards spiritual groups that will give them that sense of connection and meaning and value. But the, the original injury was usually caused from a family system or multi-generational trauma to begin with. And then it sets up the vulnerability to keep searching after meaningful relationship and community. But the cults are, are often led by um, predators who who know the wounds. And so a lot of them, they're wounded themselves and they they take on, I mean, it's, it's a classic narcissistic personality disorder um, that gets um, basically diluted with self-importance as the redeemer hero. Uh, messiah complex kind of thing and they use uh, the spirituality as a bypass to reinforce their ego which is the faults let's say if it's narcissistic personality disorder from a psycho babble <laughs> they have a false personality ego complex that is on top of a deep root core shame complex trauma completely injured uh, wounded child and so they have to create this faults better self through that's how they survive to to deal with their shit or not deal with their shit and then that just builds on the false ego and their own vulnerabilities so that that tends to create the perfect host for a um, cult leader and then they get easily manipulated by real demonic spirits and real fallen angel spirits that can give them supernatural power and they reinforce the delusions and then then they utilize that power sometimes real supernatural power in magic or they twist to, to make it look like religion and they're really actually doing a type of black magic that's what i think mm. um, there's something real to it that makes it why it's so believable and easy to get caught up into it um and that there there's something real but it's usually driven by a narcissistic hosted person or someone who becomes hosted later because they didn't deal with their shit and they believed they it, basically it was a spiritual bypass of their own unhealed wounds that drew in a lot of um, wounded people because they're wounded and they they search after that you know somebody who's going to give them the answers or appear mm -hmm. like they give them the answers and it's it's so sad um, because it happens over and over again and and but there's a true need for like real churches and real communities so. You can't blame people who are looking for that kind of connection. But um, I think that's the big takeaway with people who've been narcissistically abused or end up in cults, or they came from cult abuse and then end up going from one cult narc abuser of some sort to another. And, and, and in the process of thinking that they're healing their wounds by doing spiritual cultivation practices or prayer or doing deliverance, and but it wasn't complete because 
they didn't, the church didn't, um, they didn't really know the whole ball of wax with trauma. And there's all this bypass stuff going on that is using religion as a cover and a bypass instead of the real deal. So the real deal has to have, I think, trauma recovery and true discernment and discrimination. They call it uh, spiritual discrimination, spiritual discernment that comes with the real connection of the spirit of truth. And if that doesn't happen, you're going to get a bypass situation or a cult situation or unresolved trauma that just reinforces itself over and over again. And um, I'm sure, you know, the bypass thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say being in a cult is actually like being in a narcissistic relationship. Yeah. Um, it, it, it even has, you know, similarities, how you are being recruited. <laughs> um, it usually starts with, uh, yeah, what in a narcissistic relationship would be the love bombing phase. Yeah. Um, you are very intelligent. Only a few can see this oh, yeah. truth and fully understand it. And um, it's only for a few. So you feel chosen. Yeah. And um, yeah, you are so smart because you are following my smartness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and um, yeah, and then it goes on like that. And once you have been, yeah, fully initiated and integrated, then comes the phase where you are being discarded and they couldn't care less about you. It's terrible. And they ca can even be harsh and um, yeah, emotionally very distant and even sometimes violent. And that is exactly what happens in narcissistic relationships as well. Yeah. I think it goes several steps further when there's a... Um... Well, let's say the, the garden variety narcissist who's not, you know, let's say not religious or spiritual. Um, they don't have the wherewithal to maybe manipulate as brilliantly. It, of course, it depends on their their specialty. Uh, so sometimes their specialty is is business, um, where they're like the 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 best used car salesman, for example, or um, you know they they're a really good CEO, but they're like super manipulative, but. I think it's right when you say it's like the initial love bombing where um, they want to get you in on the deal like very quickly. So they'll come in like, oh, I really love your stuff. You know, you're really wonderful. You're so talented. And, you know, this is what I believe in. And they, they pull you in suddenly. And it's almost like a you can see certain business deals doing this, too, where it's um it's run by a somebody who wants to come in quickly with the love bombing or the feeling special and, and get, get the sale now, right? And try to get them to acquiesce to the terms and conditions of the narcissist and the, the cult beliefs that go along with that. And then after they've sucked you dry um, through their predation of the supply, right? Then you'll, they'll go through the devaluation of an eventual discard phase of basically ripping you off and the, but taking all your good stuff as part of just what they do, because that's who they are. So I could see how these similar dynamics play, not just in religious cult systems, but they, they'll go on with certain businesses as well. And, or even with, you know, like if you, if you study like spy craft, spy, spy trade craft and how they behave. And, and over time, they, they create these ways of being that's always some kind of manipulation or finagling in order to justify some agenda that is actually run by questionable um, sources at the top. Like they're all criminals at the top and you're like, Oh, you know, is this really good? Am I really doing good for my country? When you find out like, <laughs> well, never mind <laughs> the top it's, it's like, Oh man, it's all corrupt. So yeah, there is the devaluation and discard, but uh, I found it was a uh, Sam Vaknin's research into really understanding the compulsion towards the devaluation and discard, it's actually an unconscious on the, let's say in the, the garden variety narcissist personality disorder, where if they had the complex abuse that caused their own splitting uh, to create the narcissistic, let's say golden child, um, the golden child narcissist, 
and that golden child maybe was enmeshed by an overbearing mother that made them be what they are instead of just allowing them to be who they are and then being emotionally neglected let's say by the father figure and then over enmeshed by the mother who's controlling and love hate at the same time because love is always conditional then that creates the the compulsion to to individuate and separate almost dramatically um in a mean way um from the mother figure who was the overshadowing enmeshed narcissistic unhealthy mother right who wanted to have use the son as her partner because she's not getting what she needs in her primary marital relationship it's like a it's a dysfunctional pattern that happens in families where you know the golden child narcissist later gets married and then may have the, the love bombing but then they can't help themselves that once they've had the original let's say connection and bonding of intimacy they're compelled through this love hate rage need to just um, cut you off and get away from you and devalue you to justify cutting you off because they need to individuate from the mother trigger, which is where they really need to inv individuate from the enmeshed dysfunctional mother, but then they put that on you as let's say the spouse. And so they will, you know, insult you and create all kinds of massive justifications for their absence and their neglect and their devaluation, making you feel absolutely worthless, you know, not even lovable. And then eventually discard you or create the conditions that will actually get the woman to actually want to have an affair to the point of almost setting them up to have an affair by creating like triangulation where like inviting male roommates to live with you that you'd be sexually attracted to while they're gone all the time, almost like setting it up. So mm -hmm. see these behaviors, but I think in, in a lot of the garden variety narcissists, they're unconsciously compelled by their own unresolved love, hate from the enmeshed dysfunctional mother and the neglectful, complete emotional neglect from an, a, a father figure that should have protected and connected with them mm. so you you will never feel truly loved and so that you know when you're with a narcissistic figure whether it's a cult or individual when you start um like when you're still quote normal and being able to express your real feelings and let's say reactions to um how they what they do to you to make you feel absolutely like shit or when they're insulting you or ignoring you in public or you know, passive aggressive punishing behaviors in front of people. There's a whole slew of behaviors. And if you say, hey, you know, that was really shitty. That really hurt my feelings when you did that. Like you acted like, you know, I wasn't even there. You treat me like I'm an invisible, worthless piece of shit. What's that about? And then they'll say, well, I was just really busy for work. You don't know how hard I'm working and then blame it all on the need to work in the business. And that's why they have to be gone and abuse you all the time and invite roommates, even though there's enough money to not have to have roommates in the house, but they have to have people there so that they always avoid intimacy because they have to push you away. And then they have to blame it on you when you start like, wow, that really hurts. You know, how come there's no intimacy here and no connection and communication? And so they'll gaslight you to make it all your fault. And there's something wrong with you because of your history. So this is where the gaslight gets real confusing because a lot of people who come into these narcissistic relationships or cults, they're already injured from early trauma or family neglect or addictions or sexual abuse or whatever. So they already have maybe a primary wound, but when you're with a narcissist, they exacerbate your wound and then make it like, it's all your fault. You're the one with the problem. And then they, you know, they turn it up a few notches to make you the one with the problem, but they're actually fueling your triggered reactions because they know they can get away with it. So it makes it look like you're the crazy one, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so, it's so hard to, uh, to get real recovery because even, you know, marriage, I've seen marriage counselors who completely fell for the narcissist and, and the, how they made the spouse look crazy. Cause when, when you're with one long enough, what happens is you can't, well, I'm sure you know this. It's not like a mystery. You can't do the normal thing where you're normally able to express yourself as as a rational adult who has, um, you know, self-esteem and, and a sense of conviction and surety of like, yeah, I feel bad when this happens. And when you do that, you know, um, that they that's stripped away from you so that you in order to get a point across to a narcissist who's deliberately ignoring you 
and devaluing you and making you as if you're a worthless piece of shit who's telling a lie when you tell the truth. So you have to speak louder and louder and louder and get maybe more and more dramatic to get a response or to feel heard or to feel valued as a normal human being. So it could set the other person up, the one who's really not the problem, to have to be more and more dramatic and in, in, in a to solve the problem, or let's say in a, in a marriage counseling session. And so you might see this over dramatic, chaotic kind of thing play out in a marriage counseling session, but it's because the um, the narcissistically abused partner gets conditioned to um, never be able to truly express or communicate or get their needs met or be heard and understood. So they never have the, the feeling of being vindicated or that you're even real. That So you have to yell louder and louder and louder and get more and more dramatic to even get the least amount of something done or to get your, your, your needs met. So yeah. you're less to be overly dramatic or angry or have to manipulate to get your needs met or get your needs met outside the marriage because you know you'll never be able to get your true needs met or to be valued and respected at all as a human being. So it can set you off into being like, looking like you're the crazy one when you're the partner or in a cult. So this is, it, it drives actually more and more dysfunctional behavior until the original you know, thing is actually seen for what it is by somebody who's really good at facilitating, let's say a marriage couple or, but with a, with a cult kind of situation, there's like one leader, right? And that leader is like boss so that you can't come in with a board of directors to, um, to basically do something more, you know, I don't want to say uh, democratic, but there needs to be more than one witness to let's say an issue. And th this is even in the Bible where they say when you're, um, when someone is clearly quote sinning, who's in the church, for example, I know that sounds silly, but you need two or more witnesses to be able to address the problem the problem person yeah but but you know what i know for for sure that um jehovah's witnesses they apply this even to child abuse so Ooh. and now i ask you what child has two witnesses to oh. their sexual abuse they even go as far as you know if they, they do not call the police yeah they um, manage it within the congregation. Oh, that's bad. That's, that's totally bad. bad. And they even do not shy away from, let's say, when uh, there is a yeah, preaching service going from door to door, yeah, uh, to put that child with a molester in one mm -hmm. group. Oh, that's, that the that's two good. of them have to go together. Even that is happening. So, um, you know, this rule of having two witnesses um, is good and fine. But sometimes, you know, many, many people don't have any witnesses mm -hmm. to their uh, assault. And um, not, then they're not believed. Yeah. 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 That, that's classic for um, sexual abuse. And you could also extend that to what happens with alien abduction, where uh, oftentimes there's not another witness, or actually if there is, they switch them off, or they're they don't they're too afraid to say anything because they don't want to go against the grain of um, this is this is not a reality. If I say anything, they're going to think I'm crazy, so I'm just going to put up and shut up and not say anything at all. But it's really the enablers that. That that's so sick. I've seen that in family systems and churches where they they don't talk about it, and it's like, you know, the covert no talk rule of of you know the predator and the the abuser, and um, that goes on when when people feel too powerless to actually uh, create a like an escape plan. And I think this happens in I mean this happened in old Appalachian Southern Baptist um, where there's multi generational sexual abuse even in and out of the church, and if they didn't have a way to get away, like if, if women couldn't make money, 
um, and you're in a, a mountain village that's far away and you can't get support and you can't get believed, you, you don't have that option. So it's kind of like you have to go back into denial of the system that you're in and that which creates enabling like women who are manipulators and enablers of pedophiles, for example, although it could be reversed, it could be the other way around, but it creates this enabling that happens through um, sometimes denial, but sometimes the addictions will support the enabling behavior and the numbing of the awareness of what's happening with the children. So it's, it's like um, human psychology is like, if we feel like, I think if we feel like we can't survive on our own, we won't be able to face the full shocking truth of what is, because if you feel like you can't get away, your full awareness won't be on board because it can create a splitting or a death or, or physical death, like in children. Like um, mm -hmm. this is why we develop like dissociative identity disorder from early trauma. And so it really, we need to, people need to know and feel like that there is a solution that there's a, a safety net of someone who cares where you can escape the prison. And I think, um, what's what's really scary I and mean, this is a theme that has come up that i've been thinking about lately and and this happens kind of in general in the world when we talk about well, everybody's awakening now right awakening to what's happening in the world or awakening to the reality of maybe sexual abuse in the churches or cults or awakening to the reality of um these this alien invasive force that has been working and creating hybrids and invading the government and people and taking over um, and awakening to the fact that this is real, there needs to be a disclosure, okay? But what's what's more, uh, let's say, I don't wanna say scary, but what often happens, and I've, I believe this, is it's kind of like um, the Matrix movie and as a parallel, when you wake up, let's say, you're in occupied territory of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And that's a very shocking, reality to know how total and pervasive this really is and it's not really what we thought the problem was maybe we think it's only one group of people for example or no, no, no. maybe this leaders of this country or this or that and it's like mm, this is much more pervasive and if you you know wake up in occupied territory of the enemy our whole strategy of freedom and winning a war is is a totally different psychological operation or spiritual operation so this is where like if you think oh you know you could just fight your enemy and you know speak your truth and do these political advocacy lobby groups and get political about it like um, good luck with that i'm not saying that it doesn't help to educate it is just that we're in occupied territory of the enemy already we're under del delusion after delusion or non-lucidity of the reality of what we're really in so it's kind of like, um, I don't know, I feel that when we wake up and we realize, oh, wait a minute, let's say you're in marriage with a, a narcissist and you're part of the church or something and, and like your whole life revolves around this church and this individual and then you find out they're a friggin' pedophile and all your finances are tied up with all them and the cult and you're like, oh shit, then what do you do now? So you have to like plan and strategize your escape over a period of time by being like the perfect spy operative where you don't know at all that they know that they know. And then you have to make your plans accordingly. And this could take time. It could take time to escape and you have to do it without the, the predator knowing that, you know, right. Cause they're really good at knowing when you know, and they're real psychic, they have their psychic supernatural woo woo shit. Like if they're really good and this happens in cults and like SRA, so this is where like, okay, when you awaken, you can't, it's almost like you can't let them know what you're knowing and you're feeling because you know what they are and you can't apply the rules of justice and goodness and uh, equality with these people. They will not respect you. Therefore, you can't do compassionate communication with them like you would in a marriage counseling session. Uh, like, good luck with that. No, they're going to fucking kill you or they'll get rid of you. They'll target you. So 
this is where it takes a real strategy of like, okay, now that you're awakened and you're you're in this state and you can barely maintain the, the shock of the awareness and the emotional reaction of the reality of like, oh my God, uh, now what do I do? And, and what do I need to do and in order to build my strength and my power to make a, basically become somewhat invisible and you appear like you're doing something else and then you just go and do it and you take the ball and run with it while you're invisible to get away from the problem. Mm. So it's like, I think that we need to devise different strategies of liberation and even conflict, for example, that it, it may... Like when they say when you're with a narcissist, who especially who's dangerous, you know, you don't like call out the narcissist. Good luck with that, right? You know, what they're <laughs> going to do, especially if they have more power than you and they they have the purse strings and they you just end up homeless the next day without any money and without a car. And so <clears throat> you have to do things strategically and kind of uh, eat crow or uh, what they call it, be humble and not truly express the reality of what you're feeling and what you really know when you're in the presence of what's going on, the true mm -hmm. predators. And so this is where, you know, a whole different strategy must be undertaken. And, and, it, and I think it's a, it's a development of understanding how to deal with what, what we're dealing with in the world. Like this is not just one country against another or one, a typical mm -hmm. or, or a or friggin' marriage you know argument this is um when you realize what you're in we have to develop strategies and building our own internal resources to have the power to be able to deal with what's present and literally um find other ways so that they don't hammer you like hammer you in targeting so this is what i deal with and i'm sure you've seen this over and over in your the people you interview um mm -hmm. they aware of something and then as a result of their whistleblowing or their truth telling or what they discovered bam they end up a targeted individual they can die they can get sick um they can end up like disappearing for a while like what happened to so and so who was like really you know on the on youtube for a while and boom they're shadow banned they're gone they're targeted so that's what happens so to the statistics of what people think is the truth and the driving narratives of the majority is not really what it is. Mm. And I think, you know, it's the, it's the smaller <laughs> voices that tend to know what's happening. And it's, you know, the, how can we stay alive and stay balanced and empowered to continue um, bringing truth and living truth as we understand it without getting killed, without getting targeted, without having, you know, like the rape victim, you can't mm. tell the truth, you know, and how, how do we do this? Um, you know, knowing that they behave in certain ways, like, and I think this is, you know, I've told this to someone else, but they didn't understand. It was another show where um, I talked about like how the great enlightening moment that really shifted the, my life and, and my recovery was knowing and understanding what narcissistic abuse is and why the codependency narcissistic abuse thing uh, creates such a problem in true recovery until we really understand the depths of what that is, especially if your end is the codependent end and you've been victimized by these personality types that may have had a supernatural thing on top of it, that unless we truly understand the nature of that and the nature of our own wounds, we can't recover. And so we could be blaming ourselves and self-doubting and gaslighting ourselves ad infinitum until, you know, I heard this from someone else. And then I finally figured out what it was about. And then it wasn't until I understood that reality to finally understand and have insight on how to create change and, and build my own power back up again. And, and it took, you know, for me, you know, it took not only the understanding of the classic psychology and the newer psychologies coming up with narcissistic abuse, transpersonal, and then Buddhist meditation, and then back with um, complex PTSD, understanding how to recover from that and how to work with your own spiritual resources to get online with your true power. And that takes, um, you know, integrated, integrated approach 
which is not really going on in classical psychology or even classical religion per se, unless they really have the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit and the understanding of being like a, a trauma therapist at the same time. But That's how would opinion. you uh, discern if they have um, uh, the true power of the Holy Spirit? Maybe they are working with an entity as well that, that, that parades happen. around as uh, the Holy Spirit. Well, that's where it takes, uh, you know, self-connection with mm. your own heart and your spirit. And then just praying and asking for the Most High to come through to actually show you whatever the truth is in any situation. And then getting the the broad understanding of what's being said <laughs> to you, like in your, in your dreams and visions. And then <clears throat> I think it's good when we have people to reflect with like a peer a, a short peer group of a few people who are on the same level where you can kind of reflect back like dreams or insights or you really need to kind of um talk about something that happened and needing to get clear on okay was it me overreacting or was this like really going on and um i need to know to get clarity to find out am i, am I overreacting here okay so mm -hmm. self-doubt happens when uh, if you've been abused where someone says oh or you're just too sensitive you know you're always <laughs> you know making a mole out of a, a mountain out of a molehill or whatever so sometimes it takes reflecting with someone who can have a neutral approach um, <clears throat> and then reflect on you well no you didn't overreact there because if I was in that situation I, I think I would have felt the same way or may maybe more so sometimes we just need to reflect, you know, with one yeah. another. So I would also say that, um, yeah, one of the tenets that you are in a cult is usually, yeah, we have the only answer, the only true answer. Yeah, that is us. Or the other ones, yeah, the church over there. Or, that's basically how every religion operates as well. Yeah. We, we have the real truth. The other ones across the street don't go there. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what you uh, will also find is that after a while, uh, they try to eliminate your uh, existing uh, relationships with the outside world. Yeah. So that... Yeah, that is all bad for you do not listen to these toxic people it's all poison what they talk about and before you can count to three your family ties have been severed and uh, you no longer are in contact with your friends and what have you another yeah. thing is that usually if you have really questions not just to make some stink, yeah, an, an honest question. Usually they do not get answered or they look at you like, you still don't know. <laughs> and um, and of course, criticism is especially criticism, um, criticizing the leader that is a no, 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 no. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. <clears throat> that happens in... Um some of the Eastern like guru, um, like the <clears throat> there's the Eastern spiritual traditions and the Western. And the Western tends to be more individualistic, following their own voice or maybe the Christian, Judeo-Christian thing. Whereas, you know, the East may have a different <clears throat> approach of more of the, you know, the Hindu, Vedanta, Buddhist, and where they have, they honor the guru. But it's 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 good to have, I think, a perspective of both and seeing the psychology of both cultures and how best to apply what's needed for your unique. This is, this is how I would apply like oriental medicine, for example, I use as a, as an analogy that each person may have a different pulse and something going on in their system where a, a standard RX or prescription may not work for a whole group of people. It takes an individualized practitioner who can read your pulse assess what's going on with all the different meridians and then have a special uh, formula or treatment for your unique presentation based on who you are and how you deal with, let's say the five elements. 
And so, and this is how I think we need to apply um, therapeutic psychological recovery from trauma, as well as a spiritual, how we get in touch with the truth, not only inside, but outside, so that we're able to apply the best for who we are and how we've adapted to our culture and for our own weaknesses. So it's not a standard RX for everyone. Like uh, if we, we would say to someone who was, let's say, narcissistic or self-deluded to say, well, only listen to your own heart. Well, you know what, where that's going to go. They're going to be, it will encourage their self-delusion of the false ego. So sometimes we need someone wiser than ourselves to, to say, well, this is, this is what I'm seeing. And, um, you know, maybe we would consider this. And sometimes we're blind to our own uh, until we have someone else to, to do this but the only way that I think that we can truly receive that is when that other person has a type of wisdom and compassion that can uh, give you that information at the right place at the right time so that it's received in the spirit that it needs to be received to take root so that seed sprouts. So, uh, for example, like maybe one personality needs the tough love where another person needs the gentleness and the kindness and the nurture and the safety to finally receive what they need to create and formulate and kind of let those changes take place in, in our nest of safety. And then some people like need to be fucking hit over the head and say, Hey, stop that shit. You know? So <laughs> that's how I, how I see it. There's no, uh, I don't think there's no one formula for no. a whole, it depends on who we are in our culture and, and how we apply the truth of our spiritual connection, inner and outer. Mm. So I know that's a yeah, mouthful. and and especially when it comes to the point, you know, where they um, tell you how to dress and uh, how to wear your hair, you can bet your bottom dollar that you are in a cult. And I would say that yeah, follow your gut feeling because a lot of people have a gut feeling that something is wrong. Yeah, and if you find yourself researching narcissism and cults and you had it. <laughs> yeah, that, you had that it. is a good sign that, that you have a problem there because otherwise uh, you wouldn't be on that path yeah trying to understand what is really going on here i think it's it's good to be curious and um curiosity is a, is a good thing that mm -hmm. shows that there's something working to want to find the truth and um yeah that, that's a sign for sure that if, if we keep finding ourselves watching videos after videos and it could be because it still hasn't worked itself out but i believe based on what i've seen it's it's internal and personal like with our own family histories but it's also very macrocosmic world system got a problem you know what i mean so it's not just individual. This 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 goes on and it has been allowed to go on, which is a whole other understanding of how that works in larger systems of belief in business and government and all that that keeps the system going in, in bigger ways. So maybe that's for the next hour or something. Yeah, um, exactly. Because we have already finished our first hour can you believe that uh, that 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 to me it just flew by Whoosh. <laughs> i start to cough that means i i'm talking too much and i need to <laughs> <laughs> okay so that was the public hour with eve logan and we will see the patrons on the other side bye bye <laughs>